When you transition from not understanding narcissism to understanding it, they can be a painful cold bucket of water in your face. It can literally be physically painful when you look back and believe that you wasted your adult life on a, on a relationship that was never going to yield compassion or love. So when we think about the grief of the narcissistic relationship, there are lots of things that people are grieving. They're grieving the actual relationship. They may be grieving never having had a normal childhood, grieving that belief in happy endings, grieving that they won't be able to give their child that intact family, grieving getting divorced when you vowed you would never let that happen. It's not just the simple stuff like the loss of a marriage or the death of a loved one. It's very nuanced grief. But the one barrier that really complicates narcissistic grief is having to recover from the lies, from the fiction. When people slowly decide to detach from a narcissistic relationship and then actually go through the rigors of getting out of a narcissistic relationship, they are exhausted because the d divorces are messy and contentious. The family disapproval is strong. Finding a new job is difficult. Being ostracized from a group of friends is painful. It doesn't matter what kind of relationship you are trying to exit. It is very, very difficult. But the peace around lying and the lies you were told and recovering from those lies is a different kind of grief and recovery. After the initial dust settles, people look back and start feeling like they were in a Black Mirror episode and ask themselves, was any of that real? Was that, did that relationship, what, did, what would just happen? And as the lies get unearthed, when you recognize that a partner actually had been texting their lover during your birthday party, or your parent did not share lies that if you had known the truth, you have, would have changed major life decisions you made or changed things that affected the course of your life. That your partner chose to stay married to you because it was financially more expedient than getting a divorce and they didn't stay because they loved you. That all of the future fakes were fake and all of those promised things never came to fruition and were never going to happen. You were never going to do the things they married like move closer to family or have the support to go back to school or take a vacation or have kids. And now it's too late to address many of those things. So not only is it the grief of the lies, meaning you didn't or couldn't do some things, but the confusion about what was actually real in your life. It can leave people in a ruminating fog, staring at old photographs and wondering, I was smiling, but now I know it was a lie. Was I happy? Were they happy? What just happened to me and what just happened in my life? When working with survivors, I often encourage them to divide things into different categories, episodes, contexts, and feelings. When people ask themselves, was my life real? It can be really challenging because yeah, it was, as real as anything is, but the issue is not whether those things happen, but it's the interpretation and perception of those events that's getting challenged. So the question is not, when you look at the pictures, did we go to Italy? Obviously, yes, you did. You have the pictures of you standing in front of the Tower of Pisa or the yellowed boarding pass stub or the earrings you bought at a flea market. Yes, you were there. So that part was real. Yes, you did go to Italy. Yes, you did go to that restaurant or stayed in that hotel or whatever it was you did. That real part is the episode. The episode happened. But then when you look at that smile and look at that photo and you're both smiling big and then you do the math and recognize, for example, that perhaps your partner's affair was actually happening at that time. You, you just didn't know it at the time. It doesn't take away the episode. You, in fact, did get on a plane and go to Italy. 
but it changes the context. You were actually in Italy with a person who was thinking about and communicating with someone else. The trip, the physical trip was real, but the circumstances were not what you thought. And that shift in context can really do a number on your mind. Fact is the people were smiling in the picture. We don't know actually though why. Then there is the feeling part. You believed you had gone to Italy with a loving partner, maybe to address a rough patch in the relationship or take your first trip together in years. That smiling picture. You recall being happy that day. Was your partner happy that day? Who the hell knows? Maybe they were. Maybe they were actually happy having a nice time in Italy with you because it's beautiful. And they were bolstered by whatever additional narcissistic supply their affair was giving them. Maybe they weren't happy. Maybe it was a white knuckle trip for them and they had planned to divorce you. So they were smiling through gritted teeth. And the feeling part is the part that really does a number on your grief and recovery because you perceived a truth that your partner, just like in that picture with that big smile was all in or they were happy. You see that smiling picture? But in fact, it wasn't what you thought. A narcissistic relationship involves years, if not lifetimes of wishful thinking and all of that wishful thinking being drawn and rendered into a relationship. Basically, all of those justifications and hopes and beliefs in future faked promises becoming a sort of picture you have drawn of the relationship you want, the relationship you hope for, the relationship you wanted to believe in. When the lies slowly reveal themselves, the justifications are shown for what they are, and it is devastating. The cognitive dissonance, the trauma bond, all of that, the whole thing confuses you and leaves you really, conf really confused. A key element to narcissistic grief is rumination. You ruminate about the lies and why didn't I see any of this? Why didn't I leave when I saw the lies? And why didn't the people who knew about the lies say something to me? And you just play that loop over and over again. And then people who are caught in these relationships become really self-disparaging. You say things to yourself like, why was I so stupid? Why did I fall for it? Why didn't I believe the people who actually did tell me? Because we all fall for it. Cognitive dissonance is real and we break it by making that picture to be what we want. We also put the focus on ourselves. We focus on doing everything we can to make the relationship look the way we want and blame ourselves for not being perfect when it doesn't work. We put together the holidays, we put together the vacations, we put it together so we can convince ourselves I'm in a good relationship. It is traumatic to feel that you were living a sort of double life. You see the truth of it now, but while you were in it, could not imagine that it was that. When I talk to long-term survivors, the rumination really takes a toll and draws them into their own heads. They think of their younger selves who still believed in all of it, who tried so hard, and they almost feel a sense of pity for that younger, seemingly naive person. Perhaps the grief is the loss of that younger self, of, or of the exhaustion of their hope in the unavailable and rejecting partner, parent, friend, whoever it was. This area of understanding narcissistic abuse is just now evolving. Their younger selves, we're just understanding narcissistic abuse now, so their younger selves would not have been able to find a therapist who would have actually gotten it. So there was no way to get to see the light. The rumination isn't just about the lies, but also about if I had known then what I know now, if I had known what their behavior was about, I would not have spent so many years feeling crazy. It's also a rumination about spending time in a circumstance made harder by not knowing and self-blame. And then there is a period of time when a person looks back at what has happened in their narcissistic relationship and then is able to explain the episodes that made no sense at the time. The clarity, while potentially liberating, 
it's almost like breaking a code. It can leave a person working backwards to make sense of what just happened, but also feeling as though they are grieving for the hopeful person they once were, who was futilely waiting for change. Of all of the grief and recovery and harm patterns of narcissistic abuse, rumination is often cited as one of the most disruptive. It leads people to feel zoned out, stuck in the past. I often say, let it out, which is why therapy is so important. A good therapist will let you keep letting it out. And at some point, almost all of it will come out, but sharing it and bringing it into the light can help end the cycles and provide a validating and new perspective as well. In a way, the rumination can be a process of letting go and clearing space for the healthier stuff that will come. But please be patient with yourself. These things take time. There is really no, very few things that feel as bad as being duped. And when your life feels like it was one big dupe, you will often go back and play those episodes, but see them within new contexts and recognize that the feelings were not what you thought. Let's talk a little bit more about this lack of justice that characterizes all narcissistic relationships. If you have experienced a narcissistic relationship, no matter what, this has been something that's on your mind. If there is one thing, one thing that really takes a toll on survivors, it's the toll that the lack of justice raised by narcissistic relationships takes on the survivors of these relationships. Narcissistic relationships are patently unfair, mostly because a narcissist doesn't play by any rules or rules that they've made up. The narcissist often just gets to waltz off into the sunset and other people are left sifting through the messes that the narcissistic people leave in their wakes and that they don't care about. So what does this do to survivors? And why is this injustice piece so hard? Most of us, whether through school, religious teachings, storybooks, or what we were told by our families, we believe, we were told to believe that life is generally fair, hard work matters, happy endings happen, all that just world stuff. And those often drive our core beliefs. So when we experience the cognitive dissonance of a narcissistic relationship and we believe life is fair and the narcissistic relationship is deeply unfair, we feel tension and we feel uncomfortable. The tension of cognitive dissonance is usually managed by justification. But if the relationship really goes south, you get played, you get taken advantage of, abandoned, you get left financially harmed in a divorce or just buffeted by the custody system or harmed by a workplace issue or in a family matter, the justification stops working and we feel a sense of helplessness. We need justice and it doesn't come. We want revenge and there's no way to get it. Generally, there is often no real way to get revenge that is legal. Keep that in mind. It won't end you up in jail or facing a lawsuit or place other people in harm's way. Dr. Romney does not like revenge. So I am here to tell you that in most narcissistic relationships, people don't ever get vengeance at the time that they want it. And knowing, for me even tell you that it's going to come in time, however it looks, it's absolutely no solace who need their tension to be reduced right now because of how unjust this relationship is, right? So, well, when that revenge can't happen, that tension has to go somewhere. And in a small, mercifully small percentage of cases, that revenge gets externalized, right? And that's where we might see violence or other criminal behavior perpetrated by somebody wronged in narcissistic abuse situations. Again, tiny percentage of cases. Or the person experiencing the narcissistic abuse harms themselves or ends their lives. Again, none of that, thank goodness, is the norm. But it's always a risk we have to remain aware of, especially those of us working with clients in this situation. So typically, that unresolved need for revenge, right, to offset the lack of justice. Do you know what happens with that? That revenge you don't get? It turns into self-blame. 
You say, what could, what else could I have done? I'm so stupid. I didn't see it clearly. I can't believe I am this foolish. If I'd only tried this, done that, been different, been enough, said this, whatever. If I were more competent, this would not have happened. And as I have said in past recent videos on vindictiveness, the survivor even often feels guilty about thinking heavy duty revengey thoughts, but does acknowledge and maybe even smiles at the thought of something bad happening to the narcissist. That's fine. That's normal. I've done the same. That's the sequence, folks. And yes, survivors can actually feel a little lightened by thinking about revenge. But the challenge is that is if it becomes obsessive, a person gets stuck in a thought loop where they can't let it go and you're pretty much effectively stuck in the relationship. So what do you do? This is a tough one because in the absence of justice, lots of folks get stuck there for a minute. Time is your friend. Slowly but surely, these thoughts do clear, especially if you do not have to have ongoing contact with the narcissistic person. This is why this justice issue is particularly difficult for people who are in co-parenting situations and ongoing contact is mandated. If you have to have contact with the narcissist, the justice piece always it almost feels like a piece of food that's stuck in your teeth that you can't quite just get out. But just saying that time will help doesn't feel good when you are in the middle of it. Radical acceptance, thinking about it differently, it's important, but I know, meh, because it ain't justice. And here, when you can't get that justice, is where your existential game has to be on. Because ultimately, there's only one thing in the long term that will work, and that is acceptance. Be angry, go ahead and entertain those vindictive thoughts, hope for revenge, those are all fine, they're normal thoughts, let them have their turn to go through your mind. None of us are above that. But after that happens, just as it would in any process of grief, that acceptance takes us to uncomfortable but necessary places to experience the shift in belief and recognize that life is only sometimes fair, that you can extract meaning and purpose from suffering. Some people turn to karma, hoping that there might be some kind of payback for the narcissist. Sometimes there is, but not as often as you would like, or by the time it happens, you no longer care. And this can be cumulative. If you are experiencing narcissistic abuse and narcissistic injustice, and also other injustices, BS at work, maybe you get screwed by a mechanic or a contractor, just day-to-day -day stuff, and then societal issues like racism or other societal injustices, all of that will add up. And that cumulative sense of injustice can just feel cavernous and you get lost in it. I got to tell you, I suck because I don't have an answer to this. I really do spend my days and nights trying to figure out how to help survivors manage this feeling of injustice. It's very real. It's universal. People who come out the other side sometimes will say, you don't ever fully let it go. And it can color a lot of your perceptions in life, but you do move forward. And one day, you do get to the point of indifference. And after that, at some point, you may hear that it did go to hell for the narcissist and you really won't care. You may give a sort of rueful post-karmic chuckle, but beyond that, you kind of just shrug and keep going. Between that moment and now is one hell of an uphill journey. Use the time well and heal in spite of yourself. But grief is a complicated thing in a narcissistic relationship. And so let's unpack that because some of you might say, oh, if I'm grieving them this much, maybe I'm really still in it. Let's break that down. So like I said, grief is so central 
to the land that that landscape of healing from these narcissistic relationships in fact we do a whole month on grief in my healing program and probably we'll revisit again and revisit it again in some form and because narcissistic people and relationships get under our skin more than other kinds of relationships because of the trauma bonding and all the rest of it the feeling of loss we experience when it doesn't work out can be overwhelming then when we feel all that loss we wonder if maybe we are doing the wrong thing if we decide to end the relationship or disengage or set some big boundaries or even go to the extreme of ending the relationship or really going no contact but then there is that grieving of what you once believed in a just world that fairness wins out that good people win out as the bad behavior in your narcissistic relationship continues especially if other people don't notice it and they often don't you may, you may really find that you're grieving your beliefs about the world and basic constructs constructs of love that life that matter to you like justice when these relationships end or change you are having an emotional reaction to something and it's probably not the loss of them from your life so what is it a lot of what life is about is the stories we tell ourselves about it and the schemas and the narratives we hold for what has happened to us or what we hope for for some of you that may be marriage and children and you have a clear idea of what you want that to look like for others of you it may be a certain career uh, achieving a certain educational level the home you'll live in a lifestyle the number of children you will have for others it will be the idea of belonging to something like a family a community an organization or a group of friends if they're yours the hopes and things like that they're important they are important hopes they're important aspirations and these larger hopes and schemas are really what can be the issue because the narcissistic people become part of those schemas they are your spouses or partners or fiancés they are your parents or grandparents or extended family they are your siblings they are your mentors bosses or business partners they are the members of whatever community matters to you and because they are part of those systems that means changing up your relationship with them and to do that may mean having to change up your life changing up yourself and perhaps giving up on institutions and narratives and a sense of belonging to these things to these people that matter so much when you step away from a marriage or long-term relationship with a narcissistic person you may be thinking thank goodness i am getting out of this manipulative train wreck but in the same breath you are grieving what you had hoped for someone to grow old with someone to share a family with to share a life with or a history with the grief is often about those schemas narratives and hopes not necessarily the person and that can confuse the hell out of you because that narcissistic spouse or partner seemingly was the marriage it's important that you understand the difference because it is easy to confuse the grief about the loss of those things that matter to you with the idea that you are actually missing this person it absolutely makes sense because the two things are so stuck to each other now similarly with a family of origin you may be grieving ever knowing what a family a happy family was or a normal childhood or healthy sibling relationships or a place where you feel seen and valued and safe again many people may just keep throwing themselves back into the toxic dance of their families of origin because they want those things everyone wants those things and grieve not having had them however it then gets confused with the idea of grieving the family and the family members and it takes a toll over time to keep replaying the same toxic story again and again it can feel odd to grieve things that you have never really had for example the happy childhood or the happy family relationships 
but these are normal, healthy wants. We see that it is possible in other systems we witness, and every child only wants a few things, very few. They want parents that see them and love them. They want to feel safe and to be safe and to be cherished, and that's about it. Other than food, water, shelter, clothes, and education, the rest is gravy. And so, yes, it is possible to grieve what you haven't had and for that grief to color your experience of family and even your place in the world. Now, this gets very complicated if a narcissistic person dies. The unspoken and uncomfortable truth for many survivors is a complicated grief, but also a sense of relief. And that is something you cannot share in mixed company. It makes people too uncomfortable to hear that. Now, as a psychologist, I get to be a safe space and I have heard it so many times. The idea that, oh God, I, this is uncomfortable. I'm relieved that they've passed. But the grief of what, what could have been, what wasn't, what you had hoped for. And now that narcissistic person is gone, whether it's a spouse or a partner or a parent, it doesn't have a name. People may even say, hey, you didn't even like each other. Why are you so rattled now that they're gone? You may feel guilty that you aren't grieving the literal loss of this person enough. But instead, what you're grieving is the hopes for the relationship that you wanted and that went with them. People get really confused, though, when everyone is still alive. And that sense of grief will chronically pull you back in to these relational dances. Resist the impulse and sit for a minute. Write it out or take it into therapy. Figure out exactly what it is you're grieving. It may turn out that what you were experiencing was more of a conceptual grief than of missing a person who hurt you. Listen, the one thing I want to come back to, and, and I, I don't know that I've put as fine enough a point on this, many people very much love the narcissistic people in their lives from the past or even present. They'll say, this person is awful to me. I get it. Thank you. Watch your channel. Get it. Narcissistic. And there's this sense of shame about it. And we'll talk about that more on this channel. But the fact of the matter is, when you love someone and it can't be what you want, there's a grief there too. You might say, I don't like their behavior. I don't like how they go through the world. I don't like how they treat me. But I do love them as a person. It's okay for all of those things simultaneously to be true at the same time. And so, but that adds to that sense of grief. Like, why is it? Isn't my love not, is my love not good enough? And there can even be a grief of that. Your love's more than enough. But unfortunately, in any narcissistic relationship, no matter how much you love them, how, no matter how big a role they have in your life, it's, it's the nature of that personality to not be able to receive that with depth. Because I've heard this over and over again, this statement. A person saying, oh my gosh, I am a survivor of a long-term narcissistic relationship and I feel like I wasted my life. So let's break that down. Of all the many things that survivors of narcissistic abuse go through, regret is probably one of the hardest. I hear this idea that I've wasted my life from folks who come into their recognition of narcissism and how it has affected them quite a bit later in life perhaps a 60-year-old who finally recognizes the parasitic nature of the relationship that their parent had with them. And shortly, they learn that right before their parent dies, for example. A 70-year-old person after a 40-year marriage figures it out. A person who worked 35 years in a job and recognizes that they were underpaid and underappreciated and now are in a precarious position going into older age because of a controlling, tyrannical boss who claimed that they had their best interests at heart, but didn't. It's not always this long term. Some folks in even briefer relationships or even at younger ages also feel the same way. I feel like I wasted my life. There are those who simply don't get it and those who do. And there's that tiny sliver of human beings who won the human lottery and never have to deal with narcissism. When you transition from not understanding narcissism to understanding it, it can be a painful cold bucket of water in your face. It can literally be physically painful when you look back and believe that you wasted your adult life on a, on a relationship that was never going to yield compassion or love. I don't believe that. I don't believe you wasted anything. You did live a life. 
You may have lived it under a faulty premise. For example, my parent loved me or my partner was invested in our marriage. But you did live your life. Many survivors of narcissistic abuse end up with some real virtues that either they brought in or cultivated during the course of the relationship. Patience, resilience, resolve, problem-solving skills, compassion, despite it being tested on the daily, empathy, kindness, wisdom. Now, I do have to acknowledge also what gets lost in these relationships. Self-compassion, self-forgiveness, peace of mind, a sense of safety, an accurate self-appraisal of your own strengths, and your willingness to take chances on aspirations and goals. That's a lot to lose, but you did live a life. I recently spoke with a 60-year survivor of narcissistic abuse. I got to tell you, after listening to her, I didn't understand why she wasn't a rager, angry, punching walls. She said yes. Her life was hard. It is still hard. She's still in the relationship, but it was also good. She said, I raised children. I saw things that prior generations in my family never did. My children are doing well. I have grandchildren. I like my home, even though I share it with a narcissistic fool. And I finally am able to see this person is a narcissistic fool. And I'm no longer bothered by it. I love to read and watch movies and cook. I did have a life, and I recognize it could have been a different life. But isn't that true of any of us? I was like, okay, that's true. And I know this personally in myself as a survivor. Once a day at least, I find myself wondering how different my life would have been without narcissistic abuse in it. Would I have achieved more or better goals? Would I have had different love stories? Would I have had an easier life? I don't know. And this is the life I have, so I won't know. For me, my experience, coupled with my training and education as a researcher and as a clinician, drove me to take a really big chance and talk about narcissistic abuse publicly. It's something that's still not recognized by the mental health profession, so some people look at me sideways. But I had an experience, and I try to use those experiences to help people. And I do believe in my work some people have been helped. I do wish that some things had been easier in my life, but if they had been, I wouldn't be sitting here on YouTube talking people through this mess of narcissistic abuse. We end up somewhere and doing what we do on the basis of our experiences. Nobody wastes a life. Listen, and this is going to sound idiotic, but listen, let's say you only have 10 bucks in your pocket. That's all you got. And you spend it on candy bars and soda. And those candy bars and soda give you joy. I don't know, did you waste that money? I don't think you did. Someone else may come around and say, well, there's so many better things you could have done with that money. But you did what you did, and you loved the candy bars and soda, and it was fine, okay? The waste, actually, if any, anywhere the waste comes, the waste comes from believing in the narcissist. Walking through the world feeling in love, that unloved, that can feel like a waste, and I understand that too. You would have experienced life differently if you had grown up or felt love, feeling loved or seen. However, I still don't think it was a waste. You were still in the world. You were still learning and having experiences. I actually think that whenever you come into awareness about narcissistic abuse, you can run with that lesson. You get to spend the rest of your life, once you get it, you get to spend the rest of your life seeing the world more clearly. It's almost like going into a casino and being able to spot the winning machine or being able to see the cards or having magic dice. You can actually avoid being played and maybe even win. When done right, once you get it, you can actually take back joy because the narcissists steal that when you're with them. But now you see what they're about. You can stare with wonder at a night sky or feel the cool rain on a warm day or watch a hummingbird out the window with wonder and keep it to yourself and not let the narcissist suck that joy away because now you get it. You know not to share it with them because they'll minimize it and you get to be in it. 
Personally, I think surviving narcissistic abuse is sort of an unnecessary experience. I am never going to suggest that someone go out and seek narcissistic abuse out so they can learn something. Trust me, it's going to find you. But it's like a painful, torturous form of finishing school or graduate school. Listen, I went to school for a really, really, really long time to do what I had to do. While I was a student, I was broke, it was hard, I didn't make any money, but it wasn't a waste. I learned a lot, it shaped me, I got over the debt. You learn a lot from these messed up relationships, whether it's school or narcissistic relationships. Not always lessons you wanted, but none of it is a waste. Grief is a big part of the landscape of growing beyond the narcissistic relationship. We grieve the life we wanted, that we could have had, that we didn't have. But none of it was a waste. Because to spend time ruminating on the narcissistic relationship, once you understand it, that is a waste. A narcissistic relationship is a masterclass on instincts. You suspected as a child that your parent actually wasn't a very nice person, or that your sibling was mean. Or as you grew up, you saw that your partner really wasn't treating you well, or that your boss really was an asshole. Your instincts were on. And once you get it, you can welcome all those instincts back. All of this was a honing of your instincts. Understanding it brings those instincts back to life. And listen, I've been doing this for a while. I am 56 and it was only recently that I'm seeing this much, much more clearly. It wasn't a waste. For me, every broken heart, broken promise, and sadness I experienced, ultimately, it all gets poured into these videos, into words in a book, and into my lifetime commitment to helping survivors. That is how I try to recycle the anguish of narcissistic abuse into something good. So I want you to view this, your healing, as a bit of a recycling project. Take that so-called waste and turn it into something. It might be helping others. It may be pursuing your goals. It may be lifting stuff out of that bucket list. It may be simply cutting other narcissists out of your life. It is never, ever too late, ever. I hear from survivors in their 80s. And think of the alternative, that you could have gone to the end of your days never getting it. It is never too late to start an act two. Give yourself time for grief and then start recycling this so-called waste of time into a life. Sometimes the new thing that comes out of the old thing is better than anything you could have imagined. How many of you have felt that your narcissistic relationship literally made you feel heavy? You go through the world heavy, like almost like you're looking through something at everything. Like it's just heavy and everyone else seems a lot lighter. Well, let's talk about this idea whether radical acceptance can ultimately make you feel lighter. Radical acceptance is an essential building block of healing, but it's easier said than done. It's not as simple as they're not going to change, though that's a part of it. There are lots of pieces to radical acceptance. It's they're not going to change. Their behavior is not going to change. There's nothing I can do to change their behavior. There's nothing anyone can really do to change their behavior. Any behavior change they may make, even if they go into therapy, is not likely to be enough to significantly change this relationship. There is nothing else I could have done. I am not to blame for their behavior. There will always be some grief about this, right? So all these pieces, you're radically accepting all of that, right? That's a lot to take in. If it were just as simple as they're never going to change, that's actually strangely a little bit easier. It's still difficult to, to swallow that, but it's a little bit less complex. You would maybe accept that, that they're not going to change. Yeah, maybe you'd even assume like, okay, they're not going to change, so either I adjust to this or I get out. But the way that this relationship gets in and messes with your head and your soul and the sheer amount of injustice can mean that at best, radical acceptance feels like a booby prize, a weak ass consolation prize. So for all of its importance in healing, it doesn't always feel like it will help. When the radical acceptance has to be about someone you care about or love or are supposed to love or have a history with, it's not easy to take that radically accepting view on someone, the idea of them never changing, 
of this circumstance never getting better. You're still hurt. And that is why part of radical acceptance is that you may not get so-called closure or justice. And we know that healing is far more difficult in the absence of justice. So when the narcissistic person waltzes off into the sunset with their new flavor du jour, and you're left holding the bag and the pieces and really feeling the depth of feeling, which they don't because they just don't feel deeply, you actually want to tell me to go F myself with all of this radical acceptance talk, and I get it. But radical acceptance does get you somewhere. I'll give you an example. It's a silly example, but it's an example. I remember a few times way back when I was in school, high school and even college, and I was trying to wrangle and master a difficult concept, especially in a science class, like a statistics or chemistry or physics or math class. There would be a moment when I finally got it. The formula made sense. And it was as though you could never not get it right again. There was something very soothing about that moment. I was like, oh. And even though it was a hassle and a half to figure it out and learn it, and I was often pretty bored in those classes, once I got it, the anxiety lifted and I even felt lighter. As I said, I didn't enjoy these classes, but I would get it and then I'd get it and I would go on and I would do fine in the class, but I felt lighter because it was like, oh, got it. Now I've had countless clients say to me over the years, I hate radical acceptance, Dr. Romani, it sucks. I sometimes even feel like a cynical, awful person because of it, as though I can't see the bright light in someone or their potential or their hope. But then there is that day and it takes a minute, but it comes. And I have to say personally from my chair as a therapist, it's a good day for them because the radical acceptance in essence has seeped into them. It's literally gotten into their DNA. And they will say, for example, it's really gross and creepy how quickly he got into a new relationship, but I now really do see that this new person is just gonna have my experience and it'll end badly. And I'm actually to the point where I kind of honestly don't care he's someone else's problem now. Some people will say, you know, when I finally got it, understood what this radically accepted, the holiday season wasn't as bad. They're like, every single bad thing that happened every year prior during the holidays happened, but it was as though I was watching a movie I had watched before. Like on an airplane when you just sort of watch the movie again to pass the time, I kind of felt detached from it. Someone else had said to me, I really believed in this hospital I was working in, like it was a hospital as part of a university. I thought we were doing great work here in this community. But when I really saw the leadership team clearly, I really saw them, in particular two people. I was able to reflect on the good work I did in this place and know in my heart it could never be done the right way there again. And I just counted down the clock until I got my extended health care benefits and I found a new job. I think at one time I kept fighting and fighting in this job because I wanted them to do the right thing, but once I knew they never would, leaving was easier. For each of these people and their stories, it was absolute agony for them to get there. Sleepless nights, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, self-blame, self-doubt, self-disparagement, and of course, all of the BS that they had to endure in the narcissistic relationships. But all of them and many more have said, you know, once I hit radical acceptance, hard as it was, ultimately I felt lighter. And that despite the grief and the loss and the loss of the story and the life that they hoped for, they still felt lighter. So what's that about? Getting it, just understanding it, deeply at the level of radical acceptance. It lifts something off of you. Radical acceptance, like all the way down, like I said, into your DNA radical acceptance means you fully see it. And it's not what you wanted to see, but you see it and you get it. And then slowly some other things may lift a little bit too. The self-blame. You think to yourself, no, there was no other way I could have said it. No, there was nothing more I could have done. Some of the self-doubt may lift. You might think like, it may not be the right answer, but I feel more comfortable doing it this way. 
And while the rumination may not fully lift, your rumination might actually start circling back into more of a solution. It can be uncomfortable watching someone new, for example, in their life, get all of the new love bombing. You know what that was like. But then you can play the story out. You know where it goes. And the pang and the rumination may hit for a minute or even longer until you know that your ex-narcissist who's with someone new will ultimately also minimize and marginalize and mock or crumble once their lives aren't going exactly the way they want. It's how the story always goes. Thanksgiving will always be a disaster. And there was no perfect way to make it to please that narcissistic person. Once you radically accept you will have more time, more mental space, and something lifts off of you, right? In its simple form, it's like me finally understanding how the math problem worked. I still didn't like the math class, but I was able to get through it with a lot less misery. I was lighter when I walked into the classroom. I was glad when it was done, but it was easier. The grief stays with you folks. I wish I could say you radically accept and then you're light and breezy and it doesn't feel bad ever again. You will grieve not having the family you wanted or the childhood you wanted or the career you had hoped or the friend ending up being a backstabbing weasel. That stuff sucks. And when it's more primal like family, you do have that. But despite the weight of the grief, the lightness of not thinking you can do something about it, the not plotting out the chess moves to make the holiday season or the family vacation go more smoothly or lose and try to lose enough weight so he doesn't notice someone else or do the job perfectly so you're promoted. There is a lightness to knowing you no longer have to try so hard. In fact, at best, you just need to figure out some of the fundamental workarounds for your narcissistic relationship. A little bit of yellow rocking, perhaps, or some disengaging, or finding your other people out in the world to share your good news with, or starting a side hustle that can turn into a full-time gig if you could make it work. You put your energy elsewhere. You stop trying to make the narcissistic relationship work. A narcissist, being in a narcissistic relationship is a bit like living in a whodunit detective story. Because once you see it, yeah, the story becomes a lot less interesting, but it also lifts a lot of tension. And with that, a heaviness gets lifted. You do feel lighter once you radically accept. And while the grief and the ick are always there, somehow radically accepting can also foster self-compassion and even the possibility of integrating what has happened as part of a larger picture of meaning and purpose. It takes a minute. There is no fast track to this, but you will get there. And when you do, this lightness of radical acceptance will be sort of a weight loss like no other. Because when your soul feels lighter, everything fits. And one last thing, something else to help you feel a little lighter. I wanted to take a moment to let you know something exciting. And it is, I have a new book coming out in February of 2024 called It's Not You. It's available for pre-order now. Click the link in the video description to check it out mean the world to me if you pre-order it and it could become your manual on how kind of an instruction manual for how to not only navigate but ultimately heal from one of these relationships pre-order link right there click it get it thank you